Welcome to this Friday's meeting. I believe it's a season for a fulfillment of many things. By ordination, by the decision of God himself. I believe the Lord is so gracious and so kind that he constantly gives us pointers he gives us many pointers to help us access his intentions. There are many secrets in the scriptures, which I know I'm, I'm speaking slowly because it's not important to speak quickly, necessarily. And sometimes we feel um, if we move fast, it will help us win the race. No, the Bible says the race is not for the swift. Have you heard that before? It's not the person that runs the fastest that wins the race. People have taken up very fast and sprained their, their hamstrings, torn something, and could never complete the race. So not necessarily the fastest. In fact, the best at everything is, is likely at home. It's likely not competing. Oh, yes. Oh, you think the people you see in the Olympics are the, fa are the best? No, they are not. They are, they are the best who competed, who joined the sports team. Some are doctors, engineers, farmers. Not just at home. <laughs> they are not. Once in a while, there's some sports that allows almost anyone to compete. That's if they have a device to know that you're competing. Because they may not show up at all. They are not even aware there's a competition. But uh, years ago, I saw something called the strongest man. Who's seen anything like that? Those are competitions. That one, you don't really train for it. Is that you're strong or not? Uh, it's not really training. So they bring it out. Uh, so I saw a video, some, some, a short clip, very short, some um, weeks ago, maybe last month or two. And they brought in a, a well, she was female. Uh, I don't know what she meant. But she was um, a female um, bodybuilder, and the guy was a 14-year-old farm farm boy. And they kept these two heavy things, and the farm boy just... <laughs> and the a professional, they weren't serious with that one. It's not brought a woman there. But uh, generally, there is um, a strength. So, I, I, but I've seen others where they have to lift things. And these are ordinary people. Uh, live their lives. Uh, now, some have gone on to make it a professional thing, but in the past, when they had maybe a village and they're competing, competing, it wasn't based on you spend your days focusing on that. No, you just live the normal life and then they say, hey, hey, let's see who can carry who is the strongest and they would do things. And so that's where you can really say, oh, that's the strongest. That guy could pull a car with his teeth. Yeah, there are people that do things like that. And they can finish and go back to their farm, go back to their normal life. So some of the best people at anything, people that run the fastest. I'm sure I shared a story here once, a preacher told. Um, he, he was in a vehicle talking with a professional basketballer. And the fellow kept saying, ah, that hmm, there was a guy in school that was the best basketballer. He was the best. And, uh, but yeah, he never went on to become anything with it. Another person said it and he was wondering why. Then they got to a meeting, a Christian meeting, some talk lecture. And this man told this preacher, ah, that guy was talking about in the car. He's in this meeting. So it was very supernatural. And they met the fellow. And what does the guy do? Oh, the guy is a, um, a bellhop. He's a guy that you come to a hotel. He opens the door for you. 
that's what he was. And uh, they said, "Are you are you sure he was better?" They say he was better than maybe everybody. Michael Jordan, like he, like he was the best. He was really his natural talent. He was better than them all. But talent is not enough. You're going to have to add something. You're going to have to add practice, practice, practice. How can that apply to a Christian? You might have the most beautiful supernatural tongue. There is the day you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's possible angels sang aloud. And your experience was so fantastic. If you don't build on it, if you don't practice, if you don't do what um, some of those basketballers and sportsmen would do, standing in the same place and doing the same thing over and over again every day, not less than maybe throwing the ball through the hoop 200 times, alone in their backyard, there's nobody, there's no show. Every day, wake you up at a certain time, jogging. If you hear what these professional athletes do to stay at the top of the game. It's, it's incomprehensible. Unfortunately, a lot of them do it for the idol of fame and money. Now imagine if Christians did what we can do. You know, we can pray in the spirit. We can study the scriptures. We can evangelize. We can spread truth. We can pray for the sick. There was a servant of God that he said to have prayed for people a thousand times and nobody got healed. So on this day, as usual, he prayed. This elder was so in church. The wife was sick and they said, please, can you come pray for the wife? She had been bedridden for maybe weeks. Hadn't gotten up from bed. She was that bad. And he goes there and prays for her and the bed, you know, and turns and just starts to tell the husband how well that it's up to God if God will do anything that normally God doesn't. And many times, nothing. He was still talking when he, they heard behind. The woman came and passed. Like she had been instantly healed. So while he was about to explain that, likely nothing will happen because he has done this so many times, nothing ever happened. <clears throat> but he just kept doing it, just kept praying. God said, you should lay hands on the sick, they recover. So he just put his hand, Father, ask for healing. The, name of the man got healed. And thereafter, in the years ahead, it said that he may have seen a thousand healings of cancer. Like, if you can see cancer, you've seen many other things, you know. But cancer, something as terrible as that, it was very, very normal for people to be healed of all of that. And that's the same person. So many times, why we do not feel, the Bible says that oh, we, we turn back in the book of Hebrews. It says, if any man turns back, my soul will not be pleased with him. The habit of turning back, giving up, of stopping. We don't obtain God's promises through faith only, but through faith and patience. Or perseverance. Hebrews 10 38. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will take no pleasure in him. You're shrinking back. That thing where you start something and then you you pull back. A very common thing. That's why people give their lives to Christ. The last time we were here, when was that? Wednesday? Wednesday? <laughs> On Sunday, people came out to give their lives to Christ, you know. Many, many years, I've seen people come out many times to give their lives to Christ. All sorts and shapes and sizes, crying, weeping, shaking, falling, kneeling, doing all of that. But the greatest challenge there is, is the many people who shrink back. If only you understood that. What makes you survive with God is not that you didn't start. It is that after you start, you never turn back and go back permanently. That you keep pressing forward. Even if you fall, stumble, stand up. You, that 
just the mindset that just keeps going forward, no matter what happens, no matter how foolish you have been, that mindset, that is what is the difference between those who will behold the Lord and those who will not. Those who stop, those who shrink back, those who say, you know what, can't do it. Those are the people that the Lord will not be pleased with. What is faith? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So these are the people that lack faith. To shrink back means to stop having faith. He says, my righteous one, his righteous one will live by faith. The opposite of living by faith is shrinking back. You want to understand what is not faith? Does it involve your stopping the process of growing in trust? Trusting God. If we will not keep going forward, if we don't just stay at it, if we don't have this mindset that says, nothing can ever make me turn back. If, if I'll die trying to take this hill, let me die on this hill. But I will not. The option, and I really pray God that those who have come to know the Lord newly or even for a while, you really have to, sometimes I wonder if some people, if they really got born again, because you should not have the possibility of going back as an option. It shouldn't be an option. These are options on this table. With regards to whether you follow God or not, they shouldn't, there should be only one option, one thing on this table, one not one, two, three. Well, if this doesn't work, this that is why you go back. You should build your walk with God, your house with God, with one door, one entrance, one. You shouldn't have another door. If this seems to not lead to what I want, I'll come up with a plan B. And if that doesn't work, I'll have plan C. It is that ability. That's what causes divorces. That's what makes people fall away from the faith. Because you came into the Lord with the mindset that, well, let's see if this works for me. What are you talking about? Whether it works, what do you even mean by works for you? Are you asking if there's a God? You come to the Lord with the mindset that, that you will die on that hill. It's the only way. And let me tell you why it's the only way. Because if you think you found a way to have a plan B with God while being a disciple of Christ, you have failed. How do I know? You will be tested. Everyone must be tested. Every sacrifice. Mark 9 verse 49. You will be tried by fire. It's a matter of time. For everyone shall be salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Everyone shall be salted with fire. Everyone. 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 The person does not yet exist. Who is going to pull a fast one on God? No, it's a matter of fire. He can keep quiet and walk and follow you along till you're 60 years old. Then they will start the fire. What is inside is what will come out when it passes through the fire. Some people turn back very close to the end. You thought you could pull wool over God's eyes? You can't. You could pull wool over the eyes of people. People have often looked and wondered, oh, why couldn't this person make it to the end? Or how could this happen? Why it happened is because that person had to write their exams. With God, receipts are the very common. 
with God. If you are a university student or even SS3 student and you failed a, 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 a subject and you want admission to go further in your education, you're going to have to receive the course. And so many have the mindset, you know, you, you know what, I'm going to try this thing. If it doesn't work, you might as well just go back now. If it doesn't work, don't bother. God works. He knows he works. Now, let me say this. So you don't say, oh, I went to a church and the pastor said, I might as well just turn back today. No, what I'm trying to say is don't bother to say if it gets hot to a certain degree, you'll turn back. Follow the Lord. Usually, he won't allow it to get too hot for you to handle. You may think it got too hot for you to handle, but if you experienced it as you're following him, he knew, he knew you could bear it. Now, if you endure, because that's how you handle temptation, you endure. People say, no, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. First Corinthians 10, they, they quote half of the verse. The same verse, you should read all. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape so that you can stand up under it or you can bear it. He didn't say he'll take away the temptation. He said you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. And that's a picture of a wheat. A picture of a wheat. God won't tempt you. I'm looking for something heavy. What's that? Give me that back. He won't tempt you. Give me the other two. Stand up. He won't tempt you. Drop the... Okay, well, you can add it. I mean, after all. <laughs> if you don't put your hand, the thing will crush. I don't know what you're doing. Okay, give me things. Give me many things. Give me 10 things, 20 things. God. The heavier, the better. Thank you. This looks heavy. It's <laughs> not really heavy. It's just... Now, the Bible says, don't worry, overflow, get ready. So, <laughs> people on the overflow, get ready. The Bible says, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, if God allowed it come, he knew you could bear it. Yes. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape. Everybody read that. He'll provide an escape. So, everybody stops there. All of you, you've heard this quote, this verse quoted, and that's it. So you escape from under it. No, read. So that you can stand up under it. Where's the temptation? It's still on top. You're under it. That means it's still on you. Yes, sir. Uh, what does that do to your theology? Uh, I've, I've messed up your, your life again, right? Keep coming, I'll mess you up just more. Just keep coming. If you keep coming, I promise you, you think well. It won't be long. Whose is this? Ah, thank you. Uh, you are relieved. <laughs> but only for illustrative purposes. Your issue, your burdens. <laughs> I'm not involved in that. The scriptures tell you he will provide an escape. It sounds like, yes, I'm gone. Mm -mm. The escape is how to stand well. The escape will be something like when you stand. Don't hold your leg like this. You'll be harder. Spread it. Create a lock. Do you understand? Yes, sir. How many of you have seen one video? So they show this a woman and a man, soldiers holding something like this. And the man's hand got tired and he dropped it. Anyone seen that? Shot. They shot. They held up something, some heavy thing. And the man. But I don't know, probably some feminist or some silly person made that video. They are not serious. <laughs> the woman locked her hands. She held in a way, her hand locked. You understand your hand? Your is leaning, the weight is on this. The man was holding like this. The weight is on this from here to here. Huh? His hand gets tired. Same thing with your legs. You stand like this. The weight is directly, if you spread it, it's locked. Now it's on your hips. It's a, these are very simple. It's like carrying something and you carry it like this with your, you're using here. But if you sling it over your shoulder, now that burden is transferred. So how God helps you escape is that he shows you how to lock into position. Example, the position of prayer. He told Peter, temptation is coming for you. Pray so you won't fall into it. 
Now, I can't stop the temptation. Peter, Satan has asked to sift you. I've prayed for you. Not that it will not come. No, that you won't fail. Because in coming, it will come. And the person that says, how could that happen? That's not God's will. He said, Satan has requested to sift you. Who do you think he requested it from? Just read the book of Job, you know. Satan does make requests to sift people. He sifts individuals. He sifts families. He sifts churches. He sifts, he sifts nations. But he can't do it without taking permission. And the issue was that in, in Luke 22 verse 31 to 32, he says in verse 32, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. See, after, you remember how we started? If any man turns back, my soul, I will not be pleased with him. Faith, the word fail there means to cease, to finish, to finish. So your faith will not finish, okay? When you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. He knew he would turn back. Remember, if any man turns back, I'll have no pleasure in him. If he shrinks back, Hebrews 10, 38, if you shrink back. Now he tells Peter ahead of time, I've prayed for you. Your faith won't finish completely. There's going to be a turning but after you turn back again, it's when you've allowed your faith to finish that there's not a turning back. Again, you may have heard me say this years ago, about 2016, 17, you know, and I was pastoring full time for the first time. I've been pastoring people on and off one way or the other since my university days in the late 90s mid late later 90s however in 2016 it became all i did i wasn't doing nearly anything else and um i i i, I saw god was doing amazing things it was awesome but there was the reality that individual lives and I, it, there's no way i wanted to be us to be just like any other church either. I wasn't copying anybody, just doing what I had learned from the Spirit of the Lord for many years. And I realized that if you're going to be a real Christian, you have to be a Christian. I mean, not, not that you're committing morality weekly. Then you come to church, you're telling lies, you're a Yahoo boy, you're a thief, you're a in just the normal, that incredible mixture that so many so-called Christians practice. That, that thing. That thing. <laughs> that incredible, unbelievable version of Christianity that I, I don't know what it is. I, I have an idea of the real thing because I practice the real thing. I grew up with the real thing practicing that so i've lived it and i know it's possible i know it's possible to live a pure life to live an obedient life a submitted life to god i know you still make mistakes stumbles be silly sometimes but commitment is is you're you're, you're in not 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 this drama people are doing absolute drama Put on the Christian face. Come on. Turn to your neighbor. Say hallelujah three times. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Give them a high five. High five. Then you step out. Then you start to corner. Send a message. Are you coming tonight? W what's that? Like, you're a Christian. You, you believe in God. Come on. So there's all this nonsense. But, and I'm not even referring to where someone entered a season of foolishness that lasted for two weeks or one month or two, and then they repented. No, this thing where people have come to accept and say, well, this is it. There's, there's nobody that doesn't do it. And it's gone on like that for years. It's, it's part of your life. Singing while singing.
dancing while also countenancing all sorts of iniquity. No, that's not Christianity. That's that's hypocrisy. So, when I realized people would want to talk to me, what people call counseling, maybe they say, I'd like to see, and they'd say, and I remember feeling overwhelmed in the sense that I've poured out my heart, I've shared the truth as I've known it and practiced it. I've done all I can do. I've not held back. I've not acted all man of Godish, come out, stand here, say confusing things that nobody really understands half of what you have used every example, every illustration, I've demonstrated, become an actor, I've done everything just to make the point. To compare, I've said questions, questions and answers. I've done that constantly. So what more can be done when all of that seemed to have failed? You know, and I, I, I heard the Lord say to me, tell them to keep coming. Now, I'd never heard anything like that. But I, I understood in that moment, looking back now, that that's what perseverance means. Like, because I looked at it and everybody that is sincere to a degree, you want the issue to just stop. You can't understand why it doesn't stop. I mean, we had done deliverances. We prayed against my will. We prayed for people, laid hands. I mean, the Lord, for the people here that were around in 2017, October, end of October, beginning of November, I did not desire at any time to become a deliverance minister. You know, I remember approaching it through this way. In my mind, I said, I will pump them with the word of God, which is like water, so much. It will flush out all their issues. Then the Spirit of God says during a Sunday meeting, I think, that he's going to come as a fire, as a lion. He's going to sweep through the house. I didn't understand it. So people started screaming in the meeting and every time things that happened. And it went on for nearly two months, you know, and deliverances began. So really the Lord didn't wait for me anymore. Deliverances began everywhere. People would go back to their hostels and as they are on their bed, deliverances with their starts being, people would sit down in their classrooms and they'd undergo demonic deliverance. Like, the easiest way to say this, if you've ever seen them set a bush on fire and you see things running out. So that's what happened. And that's when I understood what the Lord has said that Sunday. He said I was coming. So he lit a fire. People that have been with us for months, that all their classmates were saying, this is a, you're a very serious Christian. You're a real Christian. You're, they were fine. Suddenly, things arose, which implied that some things had just gone to earth. As the word kept coming, the word of God kept coming, and they were heavy in the word. They had learned to read their Bible for hours, study, hear God, had visionary experiences, prophetic experiences. It didn't clean house. So it's, it's like doing cement work here. But the holes that were there, the snakes and the rats and the cockroaches and the unclean things just went deeper. They went subterranean, down, in. So when the fire came, <laughs> you can't withstand fire. So they came up. So lust, rage, fears, things that had roots, deep roots, erupted. The things that make most people hypocrites. The things that at the beginning of the conquest of the promised land, this is what happens. Look at me if you're looking for it in the Bible. When the Lord shows up to save his people from Egypt, signs and wonders occur, and the Jews appear untouchable. Yes? yes Have you not read? Yes, Have you read the book of Exodus? Yes, when God is delivering his people from the Egyptians, 
when they say, can you give me some gold? The people give them extra. They are terrified. Every way the Jews turn, they seem to have the upper hand. There's darkness in Egypt. There's light in Goshen where the Jews are. For everything, there's an alternative advantage for the Jews. That's how it is at the beginning of your relationship with God. Like you have victory on every side. It's so cool. They pursue you. You pass through the Red Sea. They pass. They drown. Till you hit the wilderness. Then in quote, reality. Now the other was also reality. But this experience is part of your training process. Do you understand? Your transition from where you were into the promised land must go through these stages and if you don't know this that is where you turn back it's in the wilderness that they started saying we should have died in egypt and then at a point at the border they were at kadesh Barnea, at the boundary of the desert into the promised land after they sent spies for 40 days to search out the land and come back they said let us elect a captain to take us back to Egypt. See, they, they officially said, let's turn back. That's when God showed up and said, since you made that decision to turn back, in turning back, you will not turn back. You're going to roam around in a condition known as a desert life. You will never be able to go back to Egypt. In other words, you never ever be able to be a normal unbeliever type again. Forget it. You're going to room in a space called the desert. It's a dry place. You have a little of Satan's experience. This, your life is going to be like that. It's a terrible place to be. And you're wondering if I'm exaggerating. No, the scriptures tell you it's better you had never known. Second Peter 2. Who has read it before? He says it's better they had never known the way. Give it to me. Go down to what? Towards the bottom. The saying has come true that the dog has gone back to its vomit. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn away from the holy commandment passed on to them. It's better. In other words, Egypt is better than the desert. It's better you didn't know at all. It's better you had stayed in Egypt as an unbeliever. There are some unbelievers that are a bit happy. But to be the one who believed, then you are baptized in the water, baptized in the spirit. You partook of the spiritual bread. First Corinthians 10, you read from verse 1, you see that they partook. And then the Bible tells you, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our forefathers were under the cloud as Holy Spirit baptism, and they all passed through the sea, water baptism. They were all baptized, baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In case you didn't get, those were baptisms. He made the point. They all ate the same spiritual food, okay? The Lord's table, they partook. Yeah, we are, I, I'm, I, I eat communion, I'm part of, and drank the same spiritual drink, the bread and the blood. For they drank from the spiritual rock, the body of Christ that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Verse 5, nevertheless, what is it God was? God was not pleased with most of them. Are you seeing God's pleasure again? What makes God not pleased with someone when they turn back? Yes? Yes? Sir. yes sir. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. With faith, you please God. Without faith, you displease God. He's, he will find no pleasure. Pleasure is from the word please. You do know that. Yes, sir. Please. Pleasure. It's the same word. You find pleasure when you're pleased. You are you, you you someone undergoes displeasure when you displease him. Now, go back. God was not pleased with most of them, for they were struck down in the wilderness. They had spent two years since they left Egypt till they got to that boundary. They spent 38 more years in the wilderness, moving from spot to spot. 38 more years, making it a total of 40 years. They were struck down, not in one day. 
they went down. Being compelled to be in a wilderness condition is a going down. I mean, they were going up from when Moses showed up. But they now began to go down. And they continued in that state till they died. They were the ones who had certain things they refused to give up. And hereafter, I've preached different sermons on it. Please ask for and get the messages and listen to them carefully. The five things you do that makes God become displeased with you. Not having faith is not a neutral thing. You don't sit down in one place and just do nothing and say, huh, and not have faith. It involves acts of commission and omission. That's why it's very hard to find someone that said, listen to what people try to do. I've seen Christians try to do this. Well, I don't really want to press on in this God thing like before. Uh, it's not that I'll be bad. I'll not be bad. I'll not do bad things. I'll not do bad things. Uh, it's just that I'll not be as serious. That is, I'll not be as... You know how some of you are over, <laughs> over righteous. Me, I'll not be over righteous. That is your desire. But let me help you. Okay? I have a clue. I've been born again for a while. For a good while. For 30 something years. That state you're looking for, a state where you, you are not pressing on, you hang. In the spirit realm, it's not allowed. You must either be progressing or you are regressing. If you're a witch, a wizard, and you are growing in your witchcraft, then you got to a point and you didn't want to go deeper. The other witches will take you out. You must increase. You, you must make progress. In the kingdom of God, if you say, I'll just stay soaring, at some time you need to flap. You need to exert some. You do know if you see a rocket that is staying in the air, that is exerting pressure downward with boosters. You know it's pushing up. If you ever stop pushing up, you will go down. You cannot sustain a state without effort. It's impossible. Applying that to the real Christian life. The other day I was confessing that I've not read my Bible as much as I used to. Then I'm preaching all the time. So a few times I'll, I might mix. I, I used to sit down and hear preachers preaching. And I'm completing sentences in my head before they say it. I'm, I mean, especially when it's the Bible. They are referring to something. They are calling a name. And I used to wonder, why are they struggling? Like I would know the name of the character, some obscure character they're calling. I'm knowing it. I, I had all those things on my fingertips all the time. So no one needs to tell me things I'd heard before that you can be in ministry so, so busy serving God that you do not have enough time. You are not given to your own personal thing that you can run on, on accumulated firewood. You know how you go into the bush and uh, get fi firewood and you have storage, but you don't realize that you've depleted your storage to a place where it's even risky. Now, just in case you hear me saying that and say, oh yeah, and I thought I could be listening to you. I won't listen to you again. You just confess. It's possible that my fallen state is still more than most people, you know, their reason state. So, you know, I'm making comparisons, right? You, you, you don't understand that. If you, if you used to sit and read your Bible for one, two hours every day, and now you read it for 15 minutes, you feel fallen. But there are people that don't even read it for five minutes. Do you get? And that's their normal state. In peak mood, it's 10 minutes they do. Do you understand? So I used to read it a lot. Now I still read it, but a lot is when I'm preaching. Or, and, uh, you know, and again, in one day, I may, in quotes, preach one to four times or five. I can be in four, three, four, five places where I'm opening scripture. I'm preaching and talking for one hour, for 30 minutes, for 45 minutes, for two hours, for three hours, for five hours. You know, so again, I'm surrounded by scripture. However, I'm talking about that personal where you're flipping through, where you're reading the book of Kings again. 
So when I start saying, I think it was, I didn't used to think before, I used to know. I think it was Adonija, or is it Abisha? Abijah, uh -huh. those kinds of, those are the kind of things I'm referring to. So keep me in your prayers. <laughs> I'm praying for you too. <laughs> Listen to me. We have a journey God has commenced with us. You can turn back. And when you do it, be assured of this. God can never be pleased with you. If you like, tell yourself lies. How can he be pleased with you? You're the one who turned back. If he's pleased with it, why did he tell them? He said, you won't go back. I will kill you in this wilderness. How does that manifest today? People come to the Lord, have commenced a significant journey, and they start doing all sorts of things. They are the most miserable people on earth. Unbelievers are not the most miserable. Look, didn't you see it? Second Peter 2. He said it's better. It is better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Second Peter 2 verse 21. It is better that they had not known the way of righteousness than to have known it. So it's better. Listen to me. This is why, you know, one saved always saved is a lie. Yeah. Yeah. Stand here. Stand here. Has never known the way of salvation. Has never known. Has known the way of salvation and has turned back. The Bible says it's better with you. If she cannot fall, if once you're saved and you can never be unsaved, why is it better with an unbeliever? Someone answer. I'll give you money. <laughs> I'm not playing. I'll, I'll dash you money now. How much do you want? Tell me. I'll dash you. I'll give you 5,000. Two, three, four, five. I've been looking for the answer since. For years, I begged these people, bring answer. They won't bring. See, see, this is yours. Just give me the answer to if you are saved once. Please, if you're in the overflow, come. <laughs> see, this one is yours. The Bible says it's better to have not known which way? The way of righteousness. This fellow, pure unbeliever. Oh yeah, for your hands are the pure, unchanging. <laughs> this guy has made a choice. Jesus is not for me. I don't want to know the way of righteousness. I will be how I will be. This one came to Jesus, then turned back. The Bible says it's better with this guy. What do you mean by saying that once you're saved, you cannot be unsaved? When it's better with the unsaved. In other words, look at when they began, eh? when they began, an unbeliever was here, you're here at the same point. She progressed in the Lord. Yes? yes. Then she turned back. She doesn't end. He said it's better with the unbeliever. So she, she goes to a place lower than where the unbeliever is. That my challenge was real low. I'm serious. If you have the answer, come. Come and take money. I'm not playing. I told you you'd be inviting people here. Invite people that believe all sorts of things. Bring them. For years, I begged. I want to sit down and hear someone teach me something. I don't know. Something that I am very foolish. Talking nonsense. I will sit down for years. I've said I'll sit down and listen to you. I'll give you time. 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Only one condition. I have the right to respond. That's all. And make sure you use scripture. Don't come and stand here. I feel I... The way we throw you out. Don't waste anybody's time. If you don't have at least 10, 15, even if it's three scripture, in fact, give me two, I'll, I'll give you the rest for your side. I'll give you the scripture to buttress your own point. Come. You see a, millions of people believing... You don't believe a lie. We have 66 books here. Too much evidence. Too much evidence. He says it's better for this guy than this girl. And you say, you cannot lose. So what is the future of an unbeliever? 
Now, if it's better for this guy in his future, what is your future? How can you not lose it? You don't just lose it. Your condition is worse. The only thing I'm going to add here is this. This person knew the way of righteousness. Sit down. Thank you. Look here. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. I've said for years. This diagram, I've had it for I don't know how many years. Seven years. I can't remember when the Lord taught me this. But this, about eight years ago or nine you know, when the Lord began to give me the pieces and showed me the, the possibilities. Now, I've shown you that the way is the first level. You notice that in the column where you have the way, is the same place you have righteousness. It's the same place you have the called. Many are called. Many are on the way that is broad. This is the part where the king said, Bring in everyone, go into the highways and the byways. Have you read that before? The lanes, the streets. This is broad. Broad is the way that leads to life. Who has read that before? Broad is the way that leads to life. Few. I said this four years ago, five. Stop looking at me like I said for the first time. Few. Oh, you didn't hear well that time. <laughs> I mean the older people. Few. Now is the way that leads to life. No, no, no. Give me, the, I'm, I'm wrong. That's it now. Read it. Enter through the narrow gates, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Sorry. Oh, that's why you're commenting. I'm wrong. To, I, I meant destruction. I'm sorry. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Now, watch. And many enter through it. Enter through, through it. But small, small is the gate. And narrow is the way that leads to life. And only a few find it. So what's the point I want to make? On the way to life. Now, who thinks of anybody that wants the way to destruction? Who, who can think of someone that says, excuse me, sister, do you know the way to destruction? I'm, I'm looking for destruction. If you just point the way to me, I'll, I'll appreciate it. Now, is anyone looking for destruction? No. Everybody is looking for? For life. Today is Friday night, right? Yes. Some people have gone to enjoy yes. life. <laughs> now it's destruction they are going to enjoy, but they call it life. So even people going to destruction and know it's destruction. Because when you're staggering like this and say, hey, baby, hey, baby, to people that are not your baby, you are in destruction and you know it. When you are vomiting, the next morning, you know that your life is destroyed. So when it's that who nobody opened their mouth and said destruction, so they say life. Because if you lie to yourself, maybe you won't feel so bad and so ashamed. The way that leads to destruction is broad. The way that leads to life is narrow. And that way that leads to life is the way of truth. At this point, the gate is wide. I gave you the example. I gave you the scriptures for it. The king wanted to do a banquet, and he said they should bring in everyone. He said, call everyone. And I pointed out, many are called, but few are chosen. So at the beginning, it's broad. Come on in. But as time goes on, it narrows. It narrows. Why? You pass through the truth test. And that's what I've been discussing since we began. Where the truth is revealed, God allows the fire to start burning and sees if you came to him because it was cool. Or if you are willing to pass through the waters and the fire, whether you can enjoy the refreshing of the Holy Spirit, la 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 la. 
and if you're also going to be willing to endure the ooh, ah, ooh, of the sun of persecution when it arises and scorches you everyone that says you only want one part of god you only want to enjoy the kindness but you don't do severity you only love the sweetness of god you don't love the discipline i am saying that you'll be tested and the truth that leads to life will reveal broad is the way that leads to destruction there's a destruction at the at the end of a thing there's a way that seems because there's more there are two ways there's a way that seems right and the end is destruction is death proverbs 14 12 there is a way that seems right to a man so when you get to your ways you have to ask where does this way lead to that spot is a is a junction when they tell you that's the one that leads to truth how you know it is it is narrow there won't be many people on it are you hearing me when you get to a way and they say uh, ah, can't you see where everybody is going? Just join. You just see. Everybody does it. You just join. You shouldn't pretend that you're going to tell God someday, God, you understand now. How was I to know? Everybody was doing it. He will tell you what I'm telling you now. Was it not obvious that I had said that the way that leads to destruction is wide? And many, give me back, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Many enter through it. Many enter through it. There's a narrowness that many do not enter. Few are chosen. That's how I know that few find it. Yes? Do you remember it's few that are chosen? Many are called. Few are chosen. This is the choosing point. And it also tells us, Matthew 22, verse 14, but it also tells you, Narrow is the way that leads to life, and few find it. So many people now presume that this place, from the beginning of calling on the name of the Lord, that it's narrow. It's why I gave you scriptures. If it is narrow, how come he said, call everyone? And how come he said, many are, are called? Are you understanding my point? The entrance point, justification. Do you remember how he said in Romans 10, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, what happened with time? Preachers all over began to say that, oh, for you to even come near to God, even approach to say, save me, that it's a very narrow way. You must be willing to drop everything. Who, who had those things growing up? You know, you must be, they, they set the standards of a disciple from the beginning and because of that many people just say you, you know what it's not for me and they left that's why many people don't get born again because people take the standards of the way that leads to life the way that leads to life is truth they take these standards and place it at the entrance this is the challenge you've read your bible a little if not you've heard the stories is it not obvious that when God opened the door for the Israelites to leave Egypt, he opened it to all? Is What's narrow about that? What was narrow about the way they left? Now, is that a picture of how we, the Passover and how people get saved? Yes. The stories Jesus told that I've already referred to, a king, he didn't tell these stories once. He would throw out these stories that showed that God's hands were open wide and he was welcoming many. But with time, remember, we were talking about sifting. That sifting stage is where people are filtered out. But the beginning stage is wide. Unfortunately, many of God's servants apply the filters from the beginning. 
But because I understand what I'm saying with you, I do not apply filters at the beginning. And the scriptures tell in that parable that the Lord told that the man who called for the banquet walked through his hall and saw a man who had come in and who was not wearing wedding garments. That man had come in, had not changed, continued as he was, as he used to be. Matthew 22 verse 11. This is the same king that had said, go back, please. Invite everybody. Step back, step back, step back. He has said from verse 1 or so. Uh, so he spoke to them in parables in Matthew 22. And he tells you in verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. This is the Lord Jesus telling the story. And we know he's the son. So he's talking about his father. Our God. He sent his servants to call those he had invited to the banquet, but they refused to come. And the story goes on. Now jump down to verse 6, 7. They refused to come. They even seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them, just like the Jews did to the prophets. Isaiah maltreated Jeremiah, oppressed Ezekiel, did evil to Zechariah, did all sorts of things to different servants that the Lord sent to them. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the crossroads. Are you seeing? Who knows a crossroad? Where the road crosses like this, like this junction here, this roundabout. Like any place where roads cross, a road crosses a road, creating a cross. That's a crossroad. How many of you know that they are always busy? Because people come out from all directions. Many. That's where he sends them. To go and call people. Are you understanding? Go to the crossroads and invite to the banquet as many as you can find. He sends them to where there's a crowd. Call them. Tell people to call. You don't go around saying, listen, this day I'm coming to preach is for a few people. There's only one or two of you here that will, that, 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 that will make it. No. Not at this stage, not at the stage of the way, not at the beginning. At the beginning, you throw wide, throw open the doors wide and you say, come all who labor and carry heavy loads. Come. That's for everyone. The problem with some churches is that they stay like that. That's the only condition they know. And they say God wants to save everyone. He does. But that is like saying once you have admission into the university, you don't need to write any test or any exam. Don't worry. Once you're in, you're in. You miss some tests, no problem, no problem. I told you, uh, you we got you. We got you. This is not real anywhere. You have to read, you have to study, you have to Pay a price. Slog it out. That's reality. He sent them out. Go and bring them in. Look at what it says in verse 10. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered, read with me, everyone they could find, both evil and good. Wow. Wow. Evil and good? Yes. Who told this story? Jesus the one who came from the father's bosom told this story. So he knows. He said, gather evil and good. Wow. Yeah. Matthew 13, the Bible of the wheat and the tares. Bring them all in every kind. So what, where people make a mistake is they look at a preacher and they say, and many preachers do it too. How can you let those kind of people come to your church? That's what Jesus was being accused of all the time. Hey, you're a friend of sinners. You're a friend. And he said, people that are healthy don't need a doctor. I came to seek and save the lost. I, I came for sick people. What are you talking about? I actually, that's what my father sent me for. If you're fine, you don't need medication. So I literally came to look for people with issues. But many now go around looking for people to come and be part of their church that don't have issues. I hope you're okay. I hope you don't have any issues. 
You've never had any issues, right, in your life. You, you, you too, you. Hope you guys are correct people. Correct. No. That's the opposite of why Jesus came. He came to look for incorrect people. Crooked people. K-legged people. Every ca- <laughs> They are the ones he wants. Why? Because he's a master potter. Were you here the other week? Yeah. He loves to pick mad things damaged things and make beautiful things out of them. It gives him delight. 